All right, we're back. Mm -hmm. Plowing on, it's morning. We're looking at the eight o'clock hour. It's almost time for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So my name's Jeff Fritz, that's Brady Gaster. We're back again now. I think this is our, our sixth hour together. This is our sixth hour and final for that matter. For today. Yes. The, for today. But I'll the, see you in a week. Absolutely. So. The early bird has caught the worm here. Um, we're getting ready for our next presenter. This is, who do we have coming up? This is uh, Gabriel. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be talking about realworld.net. That's good. Not like demos. Real no demos. Enough All right. demos. Enough demos. Let's talk about real world scenarios with .net. So let's, uh, let's fire up and get ready for Gabriel here. All right. We're going to go over to our fly-in video. We're going from Italy. We're going to go find Gabriel across Africa, across the oceans, in Sao Paulo. Hello. Hey, there's Gabriel. Good morning. Hey. Thanks Good so much morning. for joining us on .NET Conf. Oh, it's been fine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depends on where you are, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Gabriel, the stage is yours. Take care, man. Good luck. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, as, uh, as Jeffrey said, uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm here from Sao Paulo, Brazil, to give you uh, an introduction, not an introduction, but to give you some content regarding uh, a different way of thinking about the demos that we have uh learned in in all the demos that we 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 use it to uh watching in this conference because i i do think they are important but sometimes we we forget a little bit about how uh to to trans translate these demos into real projects right so I will, I will talk a little bit in Portuguese because I believe some people from Brazil is watching this video. Uh, but the presentation will be uh, totally uh, in English. And after the, the presentation, I will answer some questions uh, both in English and uh, in Portuguese, right? Pessoal do Brasil, bom dia, boa tarde já. Já estão chegando aqui na, na hora do almoço. Um grande abraço aí para todos que estão me assistindo. É, essa apresentação vai falar um pouquinho sobre como a gente transforma demos em mundo real, ou como que as ferramentas da Microsoft podem nos ajudar a transformar demos em mundo real. Eu vou fazer a apresentação em inglês, mas logo em seguida eu faço alguns comentários também em português e respondo questões tanto em inglês como em português, ok? Well... Let's get started. So, uh, let me do that. Hold on a second. Yes, here we go. Well, so as I told you, uh, the, the idea here is to talk about how demos are cool, but let's talk about a little bit the, uh, about the real world, right? These are my contacts. You can send me mail. You can find me at Twitter and be be free to just just call me if you need right again just remember I'll, i will do the presentation only in english but questions about the slides will be explained at the end of the tr the presentation and maybe if you have some questions specific in portuguese i can do it in portuguese again and come back to a, a single slide that it, maybe you, you don't understand well, who am I? I guess this is important because uh, sometimes we don't understand why that person is talking about that subject. And well, I'm a software architect nowadays. Uh, it's been 20 years developing solutions for retail and industry markets uh, in a, a really big company here in Brazil. Uh, and for more than 16 years, I've been studying and researching about how to develop and how to deliver uh, software with good quality. I believe since my graduation, I have this uh, worry because uh, software with bad quality means 
loss of costs, and because of that, uh, I understand that without uh, doing software with good quality, uh, things are not that uh, well done like we could do with good quality software. And because of this research, uh, in uh, 10 years ago, I started a career as a professor in a university here in Brazil. And I have the opportunity to teach about this wonderful area that we all have chosen. And this is really, really fantastic because uh, most of the time uh, we learn a lot because you have this opportunity. Like in, in this moment that uh, I'm doing this presentation, I have the opportunity to talk about uh, a subject that I love. And more than that, I can exchange some uh, info about this, this area that uh, I believe you all love. That's why you are here in this moment. Well, this is one of the reasons that you are here. But I believe that the other reason that makes you uh, uh, be here in this moment is that the velocity and the desire of the real world are increasing day by day, right? Uh, I mean, softwares do need to be uh, good, and more than that, they need to be delivered in a really fast way. And the problem is that the more we provide great and fast solutions, the more our customers will need good stuff delivered, right? And we will ask you uh, to deliver good stuff. And I'm sure that Microsoft can help us with that. I'm sure that we have uh, very, very good tools that Microsoft provides so that we can uh, uh, deliver to the, to, the, to the reality, to the real world, uh, good software. We have videos, we have demos, we have uh, events like this one, right? So I'm sure that Microsoft can help us with that. But the point is, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, I'm not sure if you, we are ready for this new world, right? Uh, we cannot develop software uh, the same way we, we use it to do uh, 10 years ago, right? And that's my question. Are you ready for this new world? Are you ready for this world with a, a really velocity for delivering solutions? And at the same time, with high quality, that's the point uh, that I'm asking you in this moment. And I really enjoyed this, this uh, comment from Satya Nadella talking about uh, the responsibilities that we have nowadays, right? The responsibilities that we have nowadays as software, develop, as software developers. Because, uh, okay, it's really, really a, a world of great opportunities, but it, it is a, a world with uh, great and big responsibilities. Uh, the pillars that uh, he had mentioned when he, he talked about this this topic uh, are privacy, cybersecurity, and ethical AI. And w of course, we can talk about each of these uh, pillars pillars uh, for uh, many many hours. But the point is, I am sure that Microsoft is doing a great job. Uh, delivering their softwares with privacy, cybersecurity, and ethical AI as basis, right? But uh, are you working on this? I mean, when you develop your uh, application, when you de develop your solution, are you worried about this scenario? Are you worried about uh, th th this, th this problem? or these topics, I mean, being more clear, are your project, projects demo-likes or are they ready for the real world? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that you have to understand that this is a demo, right? Demos are, uh, uh, they are very great to understand the concept of some uh, technologies and some solutions that we want to provide. 
but the a demo will never be your end product because it's not sustainable, right? So uh, demos are really cool, but we need to understand that they are just a startup for your project. They are not going to be your end product, right? And this is real world. Real world needs worries that in demos no, uh, we usually uh, do not care about. And because of that, we have to understand that our solutions, our softwares, they need uh, some principles, right? They need to understand that we have some principles so that we can deliver, deliver good stuff, right? And this root concept is very nice because it, 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 it really makes you understand that if you think about demos or a prototype as your end project, you're going to have a really a weak and unflexible product, right? That's the point. Uh, we need to understand that demos uh, are good to make you understand things done but you're not going to finish your job using the demos, right? And I can tell you that I have already uh, worked in many different different technologies, and this is something that it doesn't matter the technology that you are using. Uh, what matters is the principle, or are the principles that you are uh, worried about, right? Uh, no matter if you are talking about Windows Form or a Windows Service or a WPF application, .NET Compact applications, websites, .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, Xamarin, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the, uh, the, the, the technology. What it matters are the principles, right? And these principles that we need to discuss since the design of a, of, of a development, right? Uh, without these principles, I believe that we are not going to live and sleep well. And this is a, a, a point of attention that I'm trying to, to expose to you. That's why I am here in this moment, because sometimes I, I do... Uh, I, I, I watch very, very good presentations explaining uh, how you can use a technology, right? I'm sure that you have already watched in this event lots of very, very good uh, presentations explaining how to do uh, a, a specific situation, how to solve a specific problem. But believe me, this is just the start point. And you do need to think about uh, some other points and some principles so that you can uh, give back a very good solution to your customer, right? And because of that, what I, what I decided to present you, I, I decided to present you uh, three real cases where we were we, I, I say uh, as we, because I have a team here working with me, where we uh, use uh, Microsoft tools and Microsoft platform to solve what I think are really big problems, right? And that's the point uh, from, uh, from now to, to, to this presentation. I'm going to check, uh, I'm going to present you these cases describing how the technology that Microsoft provides helped me up uh, with these uh, solutions. Okay, so let's get started with the first uh, case that means real user needs and .NET Core. Well, there's a principle in, in software architecture called, called reuse. The more you reuse, the fastest is your development. So let's take a look at this scenario. I have here a Windows service that uh, was developed in 2008 and it, it is still in improvement. I mean, it's always having some uh, modifications so that we can keep up with uh, the, the current 
necessity of our customers. Well, from 2008 up to 2018, we have already developed here around 195,000 lines of well-programmed and tested code. And then we have a, a, a really, really big problem because some of our customers, they have as need uh, the desire, of, pardon, the desire of this solution in a Linux environment. Can you imagine we just uh, the situation of rewriting 195 thousand of line of lines of code, well programmed and tested to another uh, environment, to another programming language. Man, this, this uh, in many cases, uh, this will uh, make the, the project stop. That's the point. So we thought about, we checked it out, why not trying to use .NET Core console application running in Linux background as a solution? And then we started trying, uh, we started doing some tests. And this is really nice because when we started this this project here, uh, I thought, well, um, maybe w we're going to need to write some uh, some some classes and some code again, but it's okay. Let's at least at least try, because actually I saw in a, a, in a demo presentation a .NET Core console application working, and it and in that scenario it looked well, right? It it it, 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 it makes sense what uh, what what Microsoft was presenting, .NET standard and all the the, the things that we we already know about this new era of Microsoft. Okay, that was the really, really nice point. I was able to reuse 99.8% of the code. Can you imagine that? It was possible to just add the libraries as references in that console application, .NET Core console application, and I had the same libraries, the same structure. I had the same binaries working well in Linux. I have already tested this scenario in CentOS. I have already tested this scenario in uh, all, almost all the platforms that not .NET Core uh, is able to run, and it's running really, really, really well. Uh, of course, when we re when we wrote this code in the past, we thought that we could use this uh, as a code to be reused. So the the principle of reusing code uh, was there in that project in 2008. Uh, I'm sure that in 2008, I'm not uh, aware that Microsoft would love Linux like uh, Microsoft loves today. But I'm, uh, we, we have written this code using code reuse principles because uh, other uh, opportunities that we saw in that moment, right? And just because of that, Nowadays, we do have the same, the same binaries working and running in both Windows Server and Linux Server. Uh, for us, this is something really, really good. And think about uh, the user need. The user uh, needs, the user need is, well, we need the solution running in Linux. Right, but we don't want to wait uh, months to have the solution done. We just need the same solution we have in Windows running in Linux, and after some weeks, we could do some uh, great tests even in production. So understand that with this uh, uh, technology that .NET Core provides to us nowadays, 
I could deliver a well programmed and, te and tested uh, software in a small period of time. That's the point. Uh, that's why uh, we think that uh, .NET Core is now .NET Core nowadays is a really, really, really good platform for your new projects. That's why I believe that .NET Standard is the future of development, and and this is real world. That's the point. I'm not talking about a single class running a single object and with some methods. No, I'm talking about 195 thousand lines of code written. Of course, we have some points of attention and compatibility here, right? Uh, one thing that you need to remember is that Linux is case sensitive. So the files, the folders and path separators are a bit different from Windows. And in some cases, we could need some ifs like this one that we have here in this code sample. But it, this is pretty simple. You just check if you are running in a Linux platform and then as an interrupted service, you could check if you are in the Linux world or uh, if you are running Windows or, or, the, or even other platforms. Well, this first case, uh, I, I try to, to, to demonstrate to you how my Microsoft help us uh, delivering uh, fast solutions for our user uh, needs according to the, this new platform of .NET Core that we have. It's not that new, but it's good to know that it's improving, right? Now let's talk about Visual Studio. I don't know if you uh, think that Visual Studio is a good platform or not. I believe you you think about that, but uh, uh, sometimes we f we we think about Visual Studio as a really uh, difficult platform to understand, especially if you start learning uh, programming or maybe if you start. Uh, learning this environment, this Microsoft environment. Well, uh, actually, you just understand how incredible Visual Studio is when you talk about big projects. Uh, currently, I'm running with my uh, with my team a really, really, really big project. Maybe for you, this is not that big. But uh, for my environment, for my team nowadays, this is the biggest project that I have ever uh, architecture. And just to let you know, these are the numbers and the technologies that uh, we have in this project. So since the Linux service that I just mentioned to you, uh, uh, we have two other Windows services, we have microservices, we have R scripts for the machine learning that we are uh, uh, running here. We have SQL Server database, we have web apps, we have cloud services, we have bunches of libraries, we have IoT Hub with string analytics. Well, we have lots of things. And uh, I started counting for this presentation this uh, this th these projects and I got confused because there are many 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 projects and I started uh, and I thought about a different way to, to demonstrate to you uh, the quantity of projects I'm talking about and it, we have 64 projects 64 CS projects in this in this solution wow this could be uh, a really small quantity of solutions, uh, of projects for your solution, your current solution, or maybe you're going to say, wow, 64 projects, what do you mean by that? It's a platform, it's a SaaS platform, right? And the point is, uh, do you know any uh, environment, development environment, where you can manage so many different uh, kinds of projects, I don't. 
where you can have so many different ways to debug and deploy a solution. I don't. That's the point, right? Real world needs a software development environment with continuous improvement. And for me, Visual Studio is the one, right? Uh, not only because the continuous improvement of new features, but especially uh, the improvements of performance. I had the opportunity to talk about uh, a team from Visual Studio this year and uh, arguing about the performance that we we have, especially when we, we got uh, many uh, projects in a solution. Uh, the answer is we are working on it and we keep working on it and we always work on it. This is important for a company. This is important for uh, for a, 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 a product or a platform that you are developing. That you are developing, because uh, it's not only the 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 environment is the support is the community as what we are doing here, right? We are exchanging info. We are uh, talking about this. Uh, environment of VisualStudio.net. So think about that. Think that uh, without an a, a, a environment, a development environment with a good uh, quality, how can you produce good software? Right? Sometimes uh, 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 I have the opportunity to talk about uh, these different environments that we have. Uh, in the world, and I have lots of cases where people spend time and uh, spend a lot of time trying to solve solute problems regarding to the development environment. Uh, and maybe this is just because you are not using the correct tool for the correct project. You know what I mean? That's the idea here. Understand that real world needs a software development environment with continuous improvement. And I'm sure that Visual Studio is the best one that we have uh, in the world. Well, uh, this is my last case. This is my uh, last scenario. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about this pretty new uh, feature or this pretty new uh, uh, service that Microsoft is providing that is Azure DevOps. Well, uh, real world and Azure DevOps uh, uh, is a case that I understand that we are all uh, interested because we have many uh, situations and many cases where DevOps looks like the solution, the best solution. Well, uh, I, I really enjoyed this this uh, idea that uh, Donovan described it from what is DevOps. DevOps is the union of people, process, products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. And uh, uh, this is really good because uh, it's clear in the sentence that Donovan described here that it doesn't matter only the the, pro, the, the product. So Azure DevOps is the product, okay, but you need to understand the people in the process to deliver value to our end users. And because of that, I really understand that when you say that DevOps gives value to end users, I can affirm to you that real world needs DevOps. Uh, this is something that you need to think about. If you're not running a uh, uh, DevOps pipeline in your projects nowadays, uh, I would say to you that this is not the future, this is the present that uh, real world needs. Because uh, people don't understand you spend hundreds of hours developing a software without giving back something to the user. That's the point, right? But you need to think about another thing. How can we deliver value to our end users and keep environments safe? 
because it's it's a little bit uh, strained to think about continuous deliver without uh, thinking about the, the the topics that Satya had mentioned, right? And what I mean by environment safe, and I have here a sample that I, I just got from from Ledger. I'm sure that you've already uh, seen this in another presentation here in .NET Conf, but let me just uh, explain to you what I'm my, what I'm showing here. Uh, here we have the environment of Microsoft Azure, and you can start now a DevOps project using this platform. So you just say, oh, I want to create a .NET uh, platform, dot, sorry, I want to create a DevOps project using .NET uh, as language application uh, for the application. As you can see, you, you have many other different uh, options of programming language here. And then you just go next and say, well, the framework I'm going to use is .NET Core, because I'm in a .NET application. This is good. I can add a database, maybe. Great. And then I just go next and say, well, I will deploy this application in a web app. Uh, I can use a Kubernetes service. I can use a Linux web app. We have many different ways to deploy this application, a virtual machine, doesn't matter. And then you can create uh, the VSTS, the old VSTS scenario or the new Dev DevOps, uh, Azure, Azure DevOps scenario, where you just set up uh, the, the the place where your in development environment will will be managed and you just say well i'm going to uh, deploy this in azure in that specific location really good just some clicks and bang you have an environment with github with uh, pipelines with uh, GitHub, sorry, with Git as a repository, right? Using the same commands that you use in GitHub in this repository. You have boards for planning your project with different sprints. It's really easy. This is really cool. Wow. Uh, I, I believe it, it, it will take you something around 10 minutes to have this environment done for your application and it's more than that you have all the pipeline uh, for continuous development de development and deployment well but it's deployed here this is good this is really good and then you have something really interesting you can run a continuous delivery for your application. It's so easy to do that, that in some minutes you can bug your app. You know what I mean? It's so easy to make these things happen that maybe you can think about, oh, this is not demo, this is real life. No, this is not real life, right? If you deliver a solution, using only the de development stage, right? The consequence is that you're going to bug your application. You're going to bug, uh, you're going to have bugs inside your application in a fast way. And this is not good. This is not a good idea, right? So you have to remember the principles. Again, Microsoft provides you a fantastic, fantastic environment. I would say that uh, Azure DevOps is a fantastic tool. It's the best one. It's the best in class. But you need to understand that without the principles, maybe you're not going to have uh, staged environments. You're not going to have a 
approval, uh, uh, a pipeline with approvals that uh, is really important when you talk about real world. You see, it's the same tool, it's the same environment, but you need to remember this when you are developing a solution to your end user, right? Because without this uh, scenarios well planned, how can you uh, guarantee that you're going to deliver quality? That's the first principle of the of DevOps. Well, just to wrap up and just to make you sure, make sure that you understood what uh, I'm I'm describing here. Uh, you have to, to to understand that DevOps means platform as a service and more serverless, as I just described it, right? It's a fast track to deliver good software. And you can use bunches of uh, options that you, we have nowadays in Azure to deliver good software in a fast track, right? Uh, I'm sure that you have already heard about all these uh, uh, platform as a service uh, services that Microsoft provides and the serverless options that we have nowadays. All these things are fantastic, but please do not forget, do not forget the user needs, do not forget the security issues. Do not forget code reuse. Do not forget safe transition between development and production. Because uh, a tool without a, re a really good process and really good people thinking about the best way to deliver good software, it's just a tool, right? Uh, but if you want a very good tool, and if you need a tool that the real world needs nowadays, you have to understand that we find this in Microsoft environments. So these tools and all the demos and all the, 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 the environments uh, that uh, we have nowadays provided by Microsoft, they are opportunities so that you can deliver good software. However, you have to understand your responsibilities because without that, I'm sure that you're not going to deliver the good software that Microsoft is helping you to provide. Well, that's all folks. I believe I have some time for answering some questions and, may, and maybe if some people want this solution, uh, this presentation in Portuguese, I can help you up. I guess I'm gonna make a, a wrap up in Portuguese so that uh, my, my, my Brazilian uh, guys can uh, understand better what I meant here. Uh, so let's go, let's do that. And then I open for some questions if they are. Uh, bom, pessoal, é, queria agradecer primeiramente aí a oportunidade para aqueles que assistiram a essa apresentação. A minha intenção com essa apresentação é mostrar alguns casos reais em que a plataforma Microsoft me ajudou muito no meu dia a dia, no dia a dia do meu time, entregando software de maneira rápida, mas com boa qualidade. E uma das coisas que eu sempre gosto de mencionar é a importância de você lembrar dos princípios, alguns princípios que às vezes quando a gente está olhando para uma demonstração, a gente esquece, mas que no mundo real eles são importantíssimos para que a coisa aconteça. E a ideia de mostrar essa apresentação está muito relacionada a essa. Eu trouxe três exemplos, basicamente eu trouxe um exemplo de é, o reuso de código, que foi fantástico o quanto eu consegui reaproveitar de código rodando .NET Core no Linux, uma coisa que foi muito legal, a gente aproveitou muito código, realmente eu estou falando de 190 mil linhas de código aí. Depois, é, um exemplo 
da quantidade de projetos dentro de uma solução que eu acabo tendo que ter por conta de uma plataforma como, é, como uma plataforma que a gente está desenvolvendo na linha de é, software como serviço e eu não tenho dúvida que o, o Zoom Studio é a melhor ferramenta para isso porque fica muito difícil você lidar com tantos tipos de projetos em, em outras ferramentas e o último caso é essa novidade de nome, mas bem bacana aí a, a, a repaginada que foi dada na interface do, v, do DevOps Azure, né, do Azure DevOps, que é o um antigo VSTS, mas o que é mais importante é o quanto você otimiza e ganha de tempo no momento que você seta um projeto de DevOps usando o Azure como é, wizard. Só que o detalhe aí é que você precisa entender que aquele wizard que, que é entregue pelo Azure é só o começo da brincadeira, você precisa pensar nos, nos, no, nos diferentes ambientes de entrega de solução, porque senão você pode correr o risco de entregar algo até bugado para o seu cliente final, dependendo do jeito que você desenhar. DevOps é, para mim, é uma certeza há algum tempo já, mas não só uma certeza para nós desenvolvedores, para nós técnicos, uma certeza para o mercado, é o que o mercado quer. Talvez ele não saiba ainda, principalmente aqui no Brasil, mas é, é o que o mercado quer, certeza. E é isso, queria agradecer, obrigado. Vou voltar para o inglês só para agradecer o pessoal da .NET Conf e é isso, vou abrir para perguntas. Well, guys, uh, that's all. I just want to thank uh, .NET Conf team. It was awesome to be here. Uh, and, oh, thank uh, you, Gabriel. That, that, that's it. Uh, I'm open for some questions. Portuguese, English, no matter what the... Uh, Spanish, maybe. But <laughs> let, let, let's, let, let's do it. All right, so, uh, Gabriel, thank we do you. have a couple questions that... There's one I need to make sure I answer here. Um, folks are asking about video on demand, things that we've been seeing throughout the entire event here on .NET Conf. The first two days content are available on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com, go to the Visual Studio channel, there's a .NET Conf 2018 playlist. Day one and day two are both loaded there, including I see some folks calling out saying, hey, is there a Blazor talk? Including that talk from our friend Dan Roth, where he focused on Blazor. Uh, late on day two. You'll be able to find that in the playlist. I think there's 17 videos right now in there. But this video with our friend Gabriel and all the videos from our friends from around the world as part of Community Day here, you'll see end up there at some point, maybe through the weekend. And we're going to rerun all of the content for .NET Conf here on Twitch right through the weekend, back to back to back. So if there's something you missed in a different time zone, you're going to be able to check in and find that right here on the Visual Studio channel. Fantastic. So it's, uh, it's, you won't see it on Channel 9. Look for the Visual Studio channel on Channel 9, and that's where you'll find it, all right? All of the .NET confs in years past are there, and you'll find this one as well. I, I love seeing, Gabriel, I love seeing the great response to, to the Portuguese that, that we shared during, during your session here. You know, that's uh, you know, exciting to see that folks uh, were, were happy to hear, you know, other Brazilians joining into the... I'm uh, happy for the, that, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. So did anybody have... I, I'm keeping an eye on the chat room here. I'm looking for folks that might have some questions. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, Gabriel, while we're waiting for some folks here in the chat room, um, you've, you've seen some... I mean, gosh, you had that one solution that was 60-some projects that you were working on, and you had a lot of great reuse when you went from... <sighs> .NET Framework to .NET Core, how long did that conversion take you to go from .NET Framework to .NET Core? And were there any, were there any gotchas along the way that you want to make sure yeah. folks know about? Uh, yeah, let's talk about this. This, this was really, really good. Uh, I was surprised, to tell the truth, because when, when I think about converting a software, a Windows service software that was running .NET uh, 4.6.1, I believe, and then we decided to to just reuse the libraries that this software has uh, using .NET Core 2.0, uh, 
it was a, it was quite simple because when we develop when we developed uh, the Windows service, we 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 cared about how to make this code reusable in another scenarios. So it was just attach the libraries that we wrote for the Windows service, and then we just started these classes, these controller classes that we have in this uh, Linux environment. Of course, when we got, I can just come back here, when we, the, the biggest problem that we, we, we had in this scenario was, uh, here we go, uh, was the case sensitive uh, that Linux has and Windows don't. So we, we we didn't care about this when we wrote the code in English, in, in English, sorry, in, in Windows. Uh, but we had to think about that when we started uh, writing the code for both uh, environments. So this was the, the biggest problem of compatibility because in this Windows service, I have to import some data from some files and these files, uh, they are in, in specific folders, and we had to, to worry about that. But uh, in general, we just attached the same libraries and started running. It was really, really awesome, this, this point, because, man, it was, uh, for us, uh, it, I, I would say that we, if we need to, to rewrite all this code, it would take something like six months to have this, this code done again. And after these six months, we would need more time to test the, the whole application. But when you attach the same library, the same binary in just run and the things work, uh, you think about, well, so I just, I don't need to retest everything. That's the point. And that's why I, I, I try to, to bring this case because it's fantastic. Wow, that .NET Core is, is helping me a lot to deliver good features to old situations. This is, this is really amazing. So what I, um, what I also want to make sure, oh, can you hear me? Okay. So what's, what's interesting and, and what I want to make sure folks also you know, uh, check in on here is there's things like the registry, the Windows registry aren't available uh, to you in Linux. So if you're doing any oh, kind yeah. of reference to, right, check out that configuration, of course, yeah, you're going to need to store that data somewhere else. Um, did you have any yeah, issues? Exactly. Uh, Gabriel, did you have any issues dealing with user profiles and home directories and that changeover difference between, uh, between the two mm -hmm. operating systems? No, no, I, I, I don't. Even even the registry uh, scenario, uh, uh, we in this situation we we didn't use the registry for for uh, save data, so it was not a problem. Did, uh, just let you know what kind of, you use. Uh, I, I just told you, oh, 195,000 uh, lines of code. What about the, what what kind of code is that? I'm talking about a code that provides connections to different equipment, right? Uh, socket connections in a multi-thread scenario. So I'm talking about a scenario where where I can run a, at the same time uh, a thousand threads connecting to different devices, and uh, this work this work perfectly. Right, the socket the socket classes, the thread classes, they work perfectly, right? This was the scenario, and that's that's great to hear because we know that those threads and those sockets, right? Eventually, you're reaching outside of the managed world into those unmanaged resources, and to have that compatibility, you know, still work between .NET Framework, .NET Core, and onto you know Linux from Windows. Huge benefit to be able to see, and, and it, you know, uh, kind words over to the .NET Core team for ensuring that compatibility. Okay. All right. I think uh, I think that's about all the time we have. Um, so what we're gonna do? 
Um, I don't see any questions in the chat room. Okay. All right. I have a question. Hey. Um, I was oh, sure. Did, did you guys have any, you know, someone brought this up as a comment in here. It's like, we use registry in my project. We still have not decided where to move that data to. Did you guys run into a situation where you were reading values from the registry no. and, and changing some other things? Let me try to understand what, what you, you, you asking. You have a scenario where you have registry data uh, being, re, being uh, write and, and, and read and is that the scenario? Yeah, so if, if uh, in, in what Javier is saying was he's got a scenario where he's reading and writing from the registry, how would you port that when yes. you get over to Linux? Exactly. So that oh. you do, right? Oh. You, you have the least maybe, amount of code that maybe, you're writing. Maybe, maybe, maybe if, you, if you have this scenario that uh, you are writing a uh, code, uh, writing data in registry, maybe the, the, the best way, I, I would write a, a text file, a JSON file, for example, a setup file. And if I'm talking about safety, uh, we need to understand that this kind of file needs to be encrypted, right? So that people cannot uh, exchange the data that you are writing in the registry. This is one, one, one option that I would, I would use, right? An encrypted JSON file uh, uh, so that you can have the, the the data that you wrote, that you use it to, wrote, to write in, in Windows registry, you could write now in a JSON setup file. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right. Yeah, cool. but always encrypted. Even, even, even when I use, in some cases, again, you have to re think about security. If you, even when I use uh, the registry, I use to encrypt the data so that the thing uh, uh, is not so easy to find. That's the idea. That's great stuff. All right, we're, uh, we're going to cut over to our, to our next video. We've got to get ready for our next speaker. Thank you so much, Gabriel. We really appreciate you joining us Thank as part you. of .NET Con. Thank you. It was a nice pleasure. See ya. Alrighty. And friends, I hope you stick around. We're, uh, we're going to play a video or two here, and then we have Philip Carter joining us to talk about F Sharp 4.5 in the next hour. He's in studio. He's in studio. He's right here. I can see him just on the other side of the camera. Hang around. We're going to have a lot of fun. It's .NET Conf 2018.